Now, back to the fact that we're coming to you tonight from our new Garrison Hall newsroom. While it looks like the very latest thing, the building's actually well over a hundred years old. Lee Davies is very interested in the city's architecture, so she's been looking into Garrison Hall's past and future. Luckily, Hillary, the building does seem to have a future, with some protection from its Historic Places Trust classification. Anyway, we're very fond of it, as were the original owners and even the architect who designed it. The building of Garrison Hall was a project dear to the heart of architect Nathaniel Wales, who wanted a drill hall for the volunteer units. Money was found through public subscription and by the volunteers themselves, and the building was officially opened in 1879. Wales was appointed one of the seven commissioners who administered the affairs of the building. It was written into the hiring agreement for the hall that commissioners were given free passes to all the functions. And that was a worthwhile perk. From Garrison Hall stage, Henry Morton Stanley described how he met Livingston in darkest Africa. Richard Seddon welcomed home the troops. Mark Twain read extracts from his works, and concert artists like Ellen Terry performed. But in 1912, the Defence Amendment Act was passed, and overnight, Garrison Hall was taken over by the government. In the post-war years, the building was substantially altered for use by the broadcasting service. We've put it through as many changes as anyone, but this latest renovation, designed by the original firm of architects, has taken into account the building's history and worked to maintain its architectural integrity. An area of 125 square metres was renovated to accommodate our new staff. The old offices with their partitions and lowered ceilings were dismantled, and before long the original character of Garrison Hall began to shine through. The archways were a particular feature of the building, and these have been exposed and enhanced. It's an appropriate renovation for an historic building. Just as a footnote, when the government commandeered Garrison Hall, the volunteers were never compensated. In those days, the valuation of the building was £18,000. If we had to compensate them today, we'd be in the gun for around half a million dollars. One of the nicest things about our little bit of Garrison Hall is that it's been purpose designed for the work we do. New technologies meant a lot of changes in the past couple of years. Kim, that's something you're going to tell us about. Well, the easiest way for me to do that is to show you a day in the life of the programme. The newsroom starts its day with a meeting of available staff in town. Right, OK, the first thing is, I think, uh, uh, Pat on the back for Jim and Kim particularly for the good work that they did at the weekend with the earthquake. The chief reporter, Frank Campbell, usually starts with a list of the day's prospects. The electrical people have apparently, well, have they or haven't they gone to the dams, we don't know. Michael's trying to find out. Frank looks after the assignments and takes control of the items that are of national importance. John McDermott controls the South tonight. Now there's a rough idea of which stories will be required by the 6.30 news and what the South tonight will look like this evening. Just after 9 o'clock, it's out with the contact books. Reporters start arranging recording sessions, set up interviews or research. So what's this number of home? Do you know? Meanwhile, the crews are standing by for their first job of the day. Good. What time is the job? Five minutes. Right, we better get on the way. OK, bye-bye. Five minutes. Over the channel. News is shot entirely on video now. Gone are the days of film and processing. A news crew consists of a cameraman and a sound man. The camera is attached to a recorder which holds the cassettes. They're a high quality broadcast tape that's about a quarter of an inch wider than the VHS you might have at home. And this equipment is already out of date. News jobs are not always methodically planned. Crews have to be ready to jump at a moment's notice. Two o'clock on a Friday afternoon, an urgent news job. A light plane has crashed at the Tyree airstrip. For the reporter and crew involved, things get busy from now on. In a situation like this, it's important for the crew to be on the scene as soon as possible to capture the images that make the evening television bulletin. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt in this accident, and now it's up to the reporter, Mark Price, to try and find an eyewitness to the crash. He does. At the local airstrip, a club pilot saw the whole thing and an interview is called for. By now it's mid-afternoon, still a few hours to on-air time, but a lot to be done. Mark has to script quickly and he's not the only one trying to get an item out for tonight. 
But the computer word processor has revolutionised the newsroom. You no longer hear the rattle of typewriters, and once written, a script can be ripped and read straight off the printer. The next step is editing. Once again, electronic changes have brought benefits to the news. The tape that was shot on the job is put into one of these machines and a clean tape in another. The editor, today it's Mark Robinson, works with the reporter in a booth. A fair amount of teamwork is taken for granted at this stage. So we've got the interview to go now. Mm -hmm. And how long is your item altogether? Oh, about a minute and a half. A minute and a half. Sorry, the back. process is very like editing an audio cassette tape. Bits of the field tape are transferred onto the fresh tape. Most people are surprised how long it takes to get a news item ready. In this tape, it's been about three hours' work for an item that'll be on TV for a minute and a half. But only half the job is done now. This is where Hillary comes into the picture. It's about six o'clock and she's being made up. This is a relatively quiet period for her, but from here on it's often like feeding time at the zoo. Back in the newsroom, details are being completed to get the programme to air and people still editing last-minute items. Tonight there's a real panic on. There's been a technical problem with one of the tapes, which means there's no time for rehearsal, and that puts everyone on edge. The programme is underway without any hitches, and in the videotape rooms, items are being put to air smoothly. While on air, Hillary reads the story introductions off AutoCue, a system of mirrors that means she can see the script in front of the camera lens, but at home you can't see it. A tight show, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief that it went well. Time now to start working on tomorrow night's programme. So now you know all the secrets. And sadly, this is Kim's last week with us. She's off to the big smoke in Auckland, and she'll be sorely missed in Otago and Southland.